Welcome to the living room at the University of California at Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy. I'm here today with Robert Reich, who is Chancellor's Professor and Carmel P. Friesen, Professor of Public Policy at the Goldman School. We're gonna talk about capitalism and democracy in America today. So I wanna show you a clip, and it's about from 20 years ago, but here it is. My friends, we are on the way to becoming a two tiered society, composed of a few winners and a larger group of Americans left behind, whose anger and whose disillusionment is easily manipulated. Once unbottled, mass resentment can poison the very fabric of society, the moral integrity of a society, replacing ambition with envy, replacing tolerance with hate, Today, the targets of those raids, that rage, are immigrants and welfare mothers and government officials and gays and an ill-defined counterculture. But as the middle class continues to erode, who will be the targets tomorrow? So that's quite a clip, and it essentially seems to uh, predict Donald Trump. Uh, and now you've just written a book called Saving Capitalism. Couldn't you argue that Donald Trump is saving capitalism? Uh, well, he's, he's saving capitalism for the few, uh, the people at the top who have never done better, but he's not saving capitalism for the many. Uh, the vast majority of Americans have not seen much of a wage adjusted for inflation uh, in really 35 or by some measures 40 years. And uh, you have a significant group of people, most of them white men, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. who've been on a very steep downward escalator for the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, and it's pretty clear that although economics is not everything, much of the anger and anxiety and frustration that led to Donald Trump uh, really had its origin in the failure of the system and the failure of these people to flourish in that system. So, as you say, uh, Donald Trump may be saving capitalism in some sense for the capitalists, but not for the many, not for no, the I mean, rank and file. But you, I think your concern goes beyond that. Well, all his policies so far uh, have really, in many ways, hurt people at the bottom or the working class and uh, it delivered enormous benefits to people at the top, including shareholders. Um, it's very important to remind ourselves that the top richest 1% own about uh, almost 40% of the shares of stock in the United States, and the top 10% owns 80% of the shares of stock. Uh, but you're right, it's not just economics. It's, there is also an element uh, of racism that we've had for the, since the, before the founding of the Republic. Uh, but you see that's easily stirred up when people are anxious about their economics. A demagogue can come along, and this is really what I was, what I was worried about 20 years ago, Henry. Uh, uh, the, the, the ease by which, when you have a large group of angry and frustrated people, a demagogue can build a power base by scapegoating, can say, well, it's not your fault, it's their fault. Uh, and this, you know, unfortunately, the history of the 20th century in particular has a lot of examples of that going on. And that might be good for the people who are making lots of money in the short run, but in the longer run, is there some chance that could be problematic even for them? In the longer run, it is hugely problematic for them. And I, thought, I hope that what has happened is a, a kind of a warning siren uh, to the elites of America, the financial elites, uh, who depend on globalization, uh, who depend on a workforce uh, that is educated and uh, capable, who depend on a degree of peace, social peace, uh, who don't want an uprising, uh, and certainly don't want a, a, a kind of hateful divisiveness in this country that makes everything harder. Uh, you know, the rich would do better with a smaller share of a rapidly growing economy and a society that was at peace, where people w work together very well, than they're doing now with a very large share of a, an economy that's growing very slowly 
and where people are very angry and frustrated. I was talking to somebody recently from Latin America who said, you know, countries like some of the Latin American countries with great disparities in wealth are not even that enjoyable for the wealthy because they have to spend so much time and trouble to separate themselves out from the great mass of the population. So they build gated communities. They find ways to make sure that they just don't have to see the poverty and the misery. And so he said, even for the wealthy, it's not such a great deal. Well, exactly. And I think to be very, very rich in America, even America today, means that you're not coming across anybody who's not. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you're living in your own society, not only your own gated communities, but also your own private jets, uh, your own vacation spots, your own... Uh, I don't think we've seen this degree of both uh, economic and geographic and sociological devi divisiveness mm -hmm. um, between the very, very rich and everybody else, and certainly not in my lifetime. Uh, I guess the last time we saw this was in the 1890s, mm -hmm. in the Gilded Age. Uh, and that, luckily for us, ended in the progressive era when the country bounced back. I mean, we had reformers who said, no, we're, we're not going to succumb to communism or eventually fascism. Uh, we are going to reform the system. And I think that is the great gift of America. We don't succumb to, to, to ideologies. We, we are very practical. Uh, we roll up our sleeves uh, when we understand what needs to be done. But, you know, I worry about in the intervening years until we understand what, what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you do in your new book, uh, Saving Capitalism, and to some extent in the movie of the same name, is you talk about how people who talk about let's have a free market don't really understand capitalism. So let's take a situation. We've got two people in the middle of the desert. One of them's got a bunch of water and the other one's got a bunch of dates and they're on camels and they meet in the middle of the desert and they exchange water and dates. Isn't that a free market that's going on there? In what sense does that maybe not become a free market? Well, a free market depends on government setting up the rules, the rules of the game. So the person with the water uh, has a property right mm -hmm. to have the water. The person with the dates has a property right. Those rights are enforced by government. They are determined by government. They are, you know, how did the person with the water actually get the water and get the water to that spot? And why are there, uh, why does he actually possess it? Why can he trade it? Uh, the idea of trading itself is also uh, determined by contract rules uh, that government uh, makes. And the person with the, with the water can't put a gun up to the person with the gate, to the temple of the person with the gate, with the dates and say, give me your dates. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the rules of the game don't permit right. that. That would be illegal. We have all sorts of rules, bankruptcy, monopoly. Uh, the person with the water uh, cannot monopolize all the water rights. Uh, otherwise, uh, he would be selling water at a very high price. He would be extorting from other people. Where do those rules come from? Monopoly, bankruptcy, contract, property, everything else. It is government. So the whole idea that there is a free market separate from government mm -hmm. is ludicrous. And it is a highly ideological notion that I think has poisoned public debate. So this idea that there's a free market out there that exists somewhere, I tried for the desert as a free market. I was hoping that maybe you'd say, well, yeah, at least there there's a free market. But even there, it seems like there has to be some role for government and for rules. Otherwise, we just end up with banditry and mayhem. There has to be um, a setting of rules, uh, and you're absolutely right. It would be banditry, it would be mayhem. Uh, So-called black markets uh, are violent. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they are survival of the fittest, and that's what we would have. But here we get into the interesting question, which is how do the rules get established, and who has the power to make the rules? Uh, and that's, I think, where we have got to spend much more time and attention, because if you just have very, very wealthy people and if that wealth is turned into power through lobbying and through campaign contributions, then everybody who's on a downward escalator, or everybody who's not making it, mm -hmm. uh, is going to feel with some justification that the game is rigged against them. So let's go through each one of these. So in what ways, you, you have a series of chapters where you go through property and uh, a monopoly and contracts and you, you say how things have changed. So let's start with property. How, how, what's the new property? What kinds of things have changed that rig the system? Well, the new property is intellectual property. Mm -hmm. uh, that would patents, trademarks, trade names, copyrights. Uh, now, 
how long should a patent be? Uh, how long should a copyright be? Well, those are political decisions. And over time, the length of patents and copyrights continues to get longer and longer. Uh, look at the pharmaceutical industry in the United States. One of the reasons we pay more for pharmaceuticals than the citizens of any other country is because in the United States, it is legal to extend your patent on your pharmaceutical by making very tiny changes, cosmetic changes, uh, and that will give you an entire additional patent period. Uh, you can also, in this country, as you can't in most other countries, uh, let's say you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer, um, you can, uh, in a patent infringement lawsuit, you can settle with the generic manufacturer. That is somebody who mm -hmm. doesn't have a proprietary interest in, the, in, uh, in a pharmaceutical. You can settle for them to delay their introduction of your proprietary product. Pay for delay, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And I could give you five other examples of how the pharmaceutical industry has rigged the rules of the game in property mm -hmm. so that essentially we pay more. So how about Monopoly? Monopoly, uh, a good example would be in the movie, uh, there's a farmer who is making almost no money at all. Mm -hmm. And I kept on asking him about the economics. He is facing huge monopolists uh, with regard to farm supplies, fertilizer and equipment and everything else. They are consolidating like mad. They're charging more and more. He is also selling to food processors who are combining into huge monopolies. They are paying him less and less. So his margin is getting tinier and tinier and tinier. Meanwhile, the federal government is giving big farmers huge subsidies. It doesn't trickle down to this guy. So we are squeezing our poor farmers because of monopoly. Mm -hmm. How about contract? Well, contracts uh, actually are changing quite dramatically in this country. Uh, for example, there is now a doctrine that says that companies, big companies, can put mandatory arbitration clauses in contracts with consumers and with employees such that even if uh, I'm an employee or I'm a consumer and I've got a major problem, you've sold me something that threatens my life or takes away a constitutional protection, uh, f infringes my free speech if I'm an employee, I can't go to court. I've got to go to a, an arbitrator with arbitrators picked by you. Now that never used to be legal. Why is that now legal? Mm -hmm. It's legal because of the power of big corporations and uh, some very wealthy people over a political system that changes the rules of the game. So let's do one more, bankruptcy. Bankruptcy has changed again because of the power of big money uh, in the sense that it's now relatively easy for a company to reorganize itself under bankruptcy and come out of bankruptcy and continue on. Uh, it's hard, in fact, if impossible now under the bankruptcy law for, say, a student laden with student debt can't possibly, for good reasons, uh, pay, uh, wants to just reorganize the debt, can't use bankruptcy. Or let's say you are a homeowner and you uh, get caught in the downdraft of a terrible recession uh, and you want to reorganize your mortgage, can't do it. These are new impediments. They were not there 50 years ago. But they, uh, it's now easy for a casino owner like Donald Trump uh, to go into bankruptcy four or five times. Uh, an airline, every major airline has gone into bankruptcy and abrogated, completely, completely negated their labor contracts. Well, that never used to be possible, but now it's possible. So how does this affect, uh, there's the idea out there that uh, whatever you get paid, that's a fair wage because it's in a market and therefore what you're getting is fair and you shouldn't complain about it even if it's a meager wage. How does it, this kind of thing affect people's wages and maybe rig wages against them in some ways? Well, it, it rigs wages and it rigs also what people pay. So even if your wage is quote unquote fair, you may have to pay more for pharmaceuticals and everything else because of monopolies mm -hmm. and because of, of, of contracts that are, that are prejudicial to your well-being. I think the point is that when you have this extraordinary imbalance in wealth that becomes an imbalance in power, political power, due to contributions and public relations and lawyers and everything else that wealth buys, 
uh, we're, we're, we're out of the realm of a meritocracy. I mean, what you actually get in a wage um, is no longer reflects the bargaining power perhaps your father or grandfather or grandmother had uh, with a union. Uh, it no longer uh, reflects all the extras that you were paying because of monopolies. Uh, it no longer reflects your the social benefits that you are providing to society, less and less. Um, if you are a, let's say you're a hedge fund uh, mogul and you're getting a lot of uh, information about how the stock market and what companies are going to do that other countries would say is insider information that can't be traded on. In this country, now the standard is pretty loose. You're going to make a huge amount of money. That has nothing to do with merit. Mm -hmm. That has to do with you being at the right place at the right time having and knowing somebody who has insider information. So say something about um, another thing you do in your book is talk about how CEO wages have changed over time. And one argument would be, well, that's because corporations have done well and therefore CEOs get paid more. Uh, well, I mean, if, if you're a CEO of a big company starting in 1995, you could have gone into your office and played Monopoly or Tiddlywinks or, you know, Solitaire for the next 20 years, and you'd do wonderfully well because all of the shares of stock of every company went up. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't you be paid for your, your special value added over and above what has happened to the stock market? Well, that's not the case. Um, most of your payment pay is in shares of stock. The stock market has gone kablooey over the past 20 years. Uh, that is in part because you and other CEOs have fought back unions, squeezed them down to almost nothing. Uh, you have outsourced abroad. You have brought in new technology, all of which you might argue is very efficient, but it's efficient in terms of it creates additional wealth mostly for people at the top. Mm -hmm. It's not efficient in terms of creating wealth for everyone. Um, you know, Henry, and I know, and it's important that other people know, that efficiency is not, it says nothing about distributional justice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can have a more efficient system uh, and have all of the gains go to a small group that already were miles better off than everybody else. So you see this kind of thing happening where there's been rise in CEO pay, but really uh, no growth in income through the middle class and maybe, in fact, increasing poverty as one of the reasons why we get Trump voters. Well, it's one of the reasons why people are frustrated. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why people feel like the system is rigged. Mm -hmm. uh, they also feel like the system is rigged because they lived through the two, 2008 financial crisis. Most people did mm -hmm. who are alive today. Uh, they saw that the big banks uh, got away with essentially murder. Uh, they lost the, many people, millions of people lost their jobs and their savings and their homes because of that. And yet the big banks got bailed out. Uh, homeowners didn't. Mm -hmm. And not any top executive has gone to jail. In fact, they're making far more money than they did then. And people look at that, and I'm not making this up. I, I did interviews uh, extensively across the country for the book and for the movie. There are a lot of interviews in the movie in red states and in non-red states. Uh, but people feel like uh, the entire political economic system is run in such a way that they, the average person, the average working person, gets the short end of the stick. I've been working at McDonald's for four years. I work at the uh, drive thru window. I get paid twelve fifty five per hour. I make about $1,200. A, a, a month, 900 goes straight to rent, and I have to pay for gas, and then my phone bill, I end up with nothing. I sometimes have to make, uh, go to the payday loan and get a loan on my paycheck in order to make it on time and don't get any late fees and, and try to make ends meet. When I was a Secretary of Labor, the typical CEO of a large company was earning 100 times, approximately, what the typical worker was earning. Now it's up to 300 times. Uh, they see that, and they feel something's wrong.
I think also they, they worry, though, that there's not much that can be done. And one of the things your book does is talks about countervailing power. Can you talk about what you mean by that and how it might be created and what it might do? My mentor, um, the great economist, political economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, wrote a book in the early 50s called uh, American Capitalism, uh, The Theory of Countervailing Power. And he celebrated what was then considered to be an enormously successful system for everyone. The bottom fifth was doing better as a percentage every year than the top fifth. Um, and he said it was because we had, as a kind of legacy of the New Deal, institutions that countervailed the power of very big corporations and big banks and wealthy people. Uh, labor unions would be near the top of the list. But he also talked about uh, community banks and even state banks. We didn't have interstate banking the way we have now. Uh, he talked about farm cooperatives. And he went through a list. Many of these institutions were created or protected during the New Deal. And his view was that the real legacy of the New Deal was institutions that countervailed the power and thereby cre created much more equitable possibilities for people. So the question now is, can we create new countervailing institutions? We, I don't think we, we should go backwards. I mean, it, history doesn't go backwards. The question is, in front of us is, how can we give uh, average workers more bargaining power? How can we um, give uh, people politically the opportunity to come together? Uh, one thing that John Kenneth Galbraith said is in the, in the, in the, by the 1950s, political parties were still very much bottom-up institutions. State parties were very important. Now the political parties are big money-making, you know, fundraising machines. How can we create a new generation of countervailing institutions? But that's going to be hard to do because if I understand your argument, you're saying that inequality is increasing. The rich are getting richer, but then the rich can use their wealth to provide political contributions and to manipulate the system. Uh, in fact, let's just talk for a moment about the current tax bill. What does that tell us about where we are in America right now? Well, unfortunately, uh, it tells us that the game is still very much rigged. I mean, the, the biggest beneficiaries of that new tax bill are very wealthy people and big corporations that already have too much money. They don't even know what to do with all the money they have. But the good news, I think, is that we are seeing the beginnings of a political, you might say a political uprising. That is, people are saying, no, we've had enough. Uh, like the early years of the Progressive Era, 1901, 1902, um, people are, are starting to organize. And uh, in that Progressive Era, you also had muckraking journalists who might be called today investigative reporters. Mm -hmm. uh, you had some of the elite understanding, just as we talked about, that they needed to join in because the trajectory that they were on would be hard and would be terrible for them. Uh, so I'm, I, am I optimistic? I, I think I am, Henry, but I, but I have to stretch to find those sources well, I, of optimism. I think of a, a recent uh, statement by a member of Congress from the Buffalo area, Chris Collins, who said, uh, I'm getting calls from my donors, and they're, they're telling me, you better get that tax bill passed, or don't call me again to ask for money. And that suggests to me that this member of Congress thinks that it's his donors he has to worry about, not his constituents. Notice he didn't say, my constituents are calling. He said his donors, and that what the donors want is what he should do, and what the donors want him to do that's the people with money, is to pass the tax bill because they feel that that's probably going to be good for them. So this, it's really fairly uh, clear that right now it looks like that money and wealth is in the driver's and seat. And it's, it's potentially a vicious cycle yeah. because as you get more wealth and money influencing political decisions that create more opportunities for more wealth and money at the top, uh, then you see how it becomes worse and worse. But I think the future is really going to be a choice between authoritarian mm -hmm. populism. That is, uh, if it's not Donald Trump, there'll be 
Donald Trump's as far as the eye can see. Demagogues, strong men uh, who uh, use scapegoating and uh, basically tra trample on democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, and here is where the real question and the question about the progressive era comes up. Are we going to have a kind of reformist, progressive populism where the central question that people are addressing is how do we rebuild the institutions of countervailing power of democracy? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that was striking is uh, if you look at the polling data, it turns out that Sanders supporters and Trump supporters were actually agreed on the fact that they thought that free trade had not been good for them, that they thought that it was harder to get ahead in America than it used to be, so that inequality was a problem. They just were very much separated by who they blamed for this. And so the Trump supporters blamed immigrants and all sorts of other groups, basically xenophobia, for what was going on. How can we bridge the gap uh, for folks who actually agree maybe on what the economic problems are, but disagree so fundamentally in terms of sort of who's to blame? I think we start with the area where there is overlap between conservatives and progressive liberals, and that is in getting big money out of politics. Mm -hmm. One of the things I did uh, in this movie was to go and visit a fellow named David Bratt, uh, who represents the 7th District of Virginia, one of the two most conservative members of Congress, a Republican. Uh, he agreed, in fact, he was the one who was talking most of the time when we talked, uh, he and I, on the movie about the importance of ending crony capitalism, as he called it. Uh, that is, favors for big money, favors for big corporations, for individuals, simply because they donate campaign money. The intuition right now is clear. Something's wrong all over the country, right, left, everybody. Something's way off. The old assumption has been the division is Democrat versus Republican. Yeah. That's but fading. what we're beginning to see yep. is that it's actually anti-establishment yeah. versus establishment. Yep. Uh, it's people who don't want the big money and the crony capitalism versus the crony capitalists. Yeah. If you could come together on these yeah. fundamentals. Uh, it's fine with me. I think you and I are united on if we can do this in the right way, ethics and capitalism together, and we'll save the country. Could we get together, the David Bratz and people like Bernie Sanders and others who all want the democratic system to be uh, designed for the voice of the average person and not for the voice of big money. Could we get together and, uh, and have a constitutional provision that reverses Citizens United or that uh, also provided for public financing of elections, uh, that got rid of the revolving door uh, between government and business, that called for full disclosure of all sources of campaign money. Uh, there are a whole list of things that the David Bratz of the world, conservative Republicans, uh, I think could agree on with people who are liberal Democrats. Well, that's a great place to stop, and I, I would recommend your movie. It's available on Netflix, and it has the uh, signature quality that Robert Reich always demonstrates, which is both keen analytical skill, but also an enthusiasm for the possibilities of the future and that, yes, we can overcome the difficulties we face. So thank you for your enthusiasm and your optimism. Well, thank you, Henry, for your leadership. <laughs>